I realize it's a nice day outside and we're up here, but um, I had no idea I was going to write a book on Mary Prada. Initially, was doing some research on a paper for a conference, and had I known how much work this book would have been, and you know, especially during the pandemic, I would never have undertaken it. But I'm really glad I did. And in fact, I was walking here in the sunshine, thinking, I've got a really good job. <laughs> Who gets to write about art? It's a great topic, and and I um, I learned a lot about Mary. I learned a lot about art. I learned a lot about realism. I hadn't really understood photorealism in Canada or further afield in the, in the U.S. And so it was a really um, wonderful experience. And meeting Mary and her family um, was an exceptional experience as well. I've written a book couple of books on James McNeil Whistler um, and I can say that it's much nicer to work with a living artist and um, to actually um, work with living subjects as well so Donna Meany one of her models and um, to meet you know all of her associates as well so it was exceptional um, just to sort of explain the book itself Mary and I were very much in um, collaboration at the beginning before she died in 2018 and um, I'd given her a very extensive outline and um, she said go for it and she pretty much gave me free reign but was always accessible through interviews. I went several times to St. John's to visit her and her family and to interview and so the book is very informed by that. But I also work at Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick, and if you haven't heard of it, it's the um, alma mater of Mary and Christopher Pratt. So um, I was fortunate enough to have an archive actually on my doorstep, and I've never had that opportunity before, and it's, it's, um, it's a rare experience for a researcher or writer. So I could go and, you know, if I was unsure if I'd quoted something correctly, I could go and double check. Um, and Mary has not only donated her papers to the um, archive, but all of her source slides and all of her materials. So, for instance, if she took a photograph of, say, the pomegranate, oh no, these aren't pomegranates, what, what are those things? I don't know. The fruit, the persimmon, <laughs> thank you. Um, if she'd taken a, a photo of them, um, that photo would be in the archive. And so I could compare the original to what she painted, and I learned a lot about her work in that process. And it's, I think she, it's a very rare archival collection for that very reason. She's also donated, donated a lot to our university art gallery called the Owens Art Gallery. And so there's a lot of her work, there's a lot of her, um, uh, her, her drawings, her prints, and also um, her storyboards, because she was very interested in, in making films. Um, she only realized one, which was a very odd film called This Little Piggy. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it, um, but it's, it's an unusual film that um, was shown through Adrian Clarkson Presents, that program, and um, it got, she got a lot of flack for it because a, a little piglet is butchered in the film. It's only been shown very rarely, um, but it's, it's with, I think it's with CBC in the archives so if you want to uh, try to find it. So I thought I'd explain my, my, my practice as a writer and, and the structure of the book. It's divided into 10 chapters. Um, and some of them are based thematically on shows she might have had. Um, in fact, the opening chapter is called The House Inside My Mother's House, which was an exhibition she had here at Mir Godard's. And so it's really interesting how I could weave the the, the autobiography of her life into her own way of seeing her work. And so, for instance, the first chapter is about her childhood in Fredericton, but it also is how she looked at her own life in the 90s, looking back at her, you know, at her um, growing up in Fredericton. So the house inside my mother's house is a reference to the house she lived in, um, in Fredericton, in a, a beautiful neighborhood. And the house was built by her father, well, not physically, but he had the money. And it, but it was always known as her mother's house. And, um, and the house inside my mother's house was a dollhouse that her father did make for uh, Mary and her sister that she played with as a child. And it was always on the landing of the staircase. 
Um, so that history is kind of embedded. And the book doesn't just read chronologically. It weaves back and forth with these alternative narratives that were Mary's narratives. And so it's, it's I hope, a very accessible book. It's just not like today I went to the grocery store and then I went and saw this or that. It's, it's more like how she perceived her world. Um, and, and with that, I just want to talk a little bit about my subtitle, A Love Affair with Vision. Um, I actually got the um, quotation. It's Mary speaking to the National Gallery curator, Jonathan Shaughnessy. And it's in an interview. You can find it online. And uh, Jonathan was interviewing her for a show, her first um, show at the, at the National Gallery, solo show. And he asked her about the painting The Bed, which was a critical work for her. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But she um, was very interested in this idea of um, kind of, it, she realized her, her muse was the light, looking at how light fell on objects and the shadows. And that became the premise for her, her idea of working. And so she, um, she in, in a, a book that she wrote, uh, which is a collection of her writing as well as some of her journals, um, it's entitled The Personal Calligraphy. Under the last section, The Feel of Things, she writes, I've never wanted to paint what, what I did not know intimately and sensually. She continues, the look of things, the feel of things, their ability to arouse me has led me along the paths you see in my pictures. Elsewhere, she has said, my eyes had become for me a conduit for physical sensation. On first seeing her unmade bed illuminated by the morning sun. This embodied response became critical to how Pratt received, perceived her world. Much later, she returns to discuss this moment with the curator of contemporary art um, at the National Gallery, Jonathan Shaughnessy. This interview in 2015 marked Pratt's first solo exhibition at the gallery. She was 80. Pratt explains how in this moment, a new visual understanding of her work was revealed to her. I hope that I could bring that erotic charge to the paintings. She describes her sensual way of seeing. It was a love affair with vision, a real love affair with vision. Um, so this biography uh, embraces her unique approach uh, to the visual and tells her own story. Um, so after Mary died, I had to lean a lot on her diaries. They're extensive diaries and extensive um, writing, uh, like reviews about her work in the archive. And it's very unusual for an artist to have kept so many journals. So they really um, inform uh, a lot of the book. And I was always looking for those intersections when she spoke about her work. She doesn't do it a lot in her journals, but when she does, they were like gold nuggets. And so I could weave in the narratives to how she was thinking about the work as she was painting the work. And I, I, that just got me very excited um, in terms of, of the book. Um, so I want to also talk about another show that was here at the Mir Godard Gallery. And she was very um, good friends with Mir Godard and Gisela. Um, and the, the staff here, and she uh, was part of a group show called The Self-Portrait Show that was held in 2012, maybe? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and anyway, she, um, she became very interested in, um, in, like, the paper at this conference where I was to give a, pa a, a paper, um, was about women's self-portraiture. And I pitched the idea of Mary's self-portraits, but I realized that she does very few self-portraits, but that her work is extremely autobiographical. And so the work functions as a form of self-portraiture. And many artists and critics will argue that that is always the case, that, that you know, even if you write a book of fiction, it's about you, the writer, as much as about anything else. Um, so I just want to open with um, my first introduction to Mary and her family in St. John's. Over tea and homemade cake, one of Mary's recipes, I talk about my visit to the gallery. Um, this is the rooms in, in St. John's, and mention the work of Pratt's children, Barbara and Nat, on display. Um, I describe Barbara's painter, painting of a huge red tanker with a tiny white fishing boat just visible next to it 
Anne tells me, well, that's the dream she painted. I'm curious and ask her to elaborate. She explains that all her siblings have had this recurring dream since childhood. Mary also experiences the dreams, the dream and believes it's part of her West family heritage. The Pratt family refer to it as the dream or the big little dream that often begins with an overwhelming sensation of an inexplicable being or thing that looms large next to something very small. Ned describes it as an unsettling presence. The family has different theories about the meaning of this strange dream. Some suggest it symbolizes the moment of conception, while others consider it uh, to reflect the mother-baby bond, or even the tiny fetus within the much larger maternal body. I am intrigued. And um, I found in her journal, much, I think a couple of years after that first interaction, Mary wrote, there's a sort of dream that used to come to my children at night and it also came to me. And when I've questioned friends, I find that it comes to lots of people. It manifests itself in rather different ways. One of my children would cry out, there's a pumpkin mummy, a pumpkin and a pin. I don't know which, I don't know which. Another child would cry, there's this big soft cloud and this little sharp shiny thing. And I'd go and, see, and get them wet cloths to wipe their face faces and cool their hands, just as my mother had done when I cried out, oh, it's so big and it's so tiny, which is it? It's both, both at once. Recently, it has occurred to me that this persistent dream comes to remind us that concepts must be vast, limitless, but the executions must be sharp and precise. Mm -hmm. And I realized she was also talking about her own work. So it just was a wonderful, um, more metaphoric way to think about her work. And so I mentioned this show um, on self-portraiture, and Mary had actually painted Silver Bull and Salmonier, a self-portrait, which you can't see, but it's, it's in the book, and it's, um, oh, maybe I'll just sort of show you, because yeah. <laughs> I don't have any slides. <laughs> oh, Donna, hi, I didn't realize you were there. <laughs> so this was a group show, and it actually, has, um, you can see the bowl, the silver bowl reflects Mary's self-portrait. So it made me think of all those Dutch portraits of where women, particularly women Dutch painters, um, would paint themselves in, but there were many other examples. You, you know the you. work. <laughs> no, thank you. So I got really excited because this kind of dream metaphor and then the, um, the idea of, um, of being able to link uh, this, this painting, so I'll just go into it. Um, th this recurring dream now informs my interpretation of Pratt's painting, Silver Bowl in Samuel, a self-portrait. And when I gave the paper at this conference, I didn't know the, the family dream history. Um, so I realized after I heard that story, I, I could look at this painting anew. This work has a strange allure with its hand-blown glass orb that floats like a vast unknown presence alongside the small silver bowl filled with paper white bulbs. The glass orb, the base of the lamp, appears like an immense bubble in danger of being pricked by the twisting tips of the pale green leaves. In the family dream, there is a foreboding sense that something is about to happen between the two entities, the big and the little. Ned later explains to me, it's about something absolutely massive in weight and volume, threatened by the proximity of something very tiny, and the tiny thing, though fragile, is much more strong and powerful than, than the massive thing. Much of Pratt's work is about the perceptually felt sensations that extend beyond the visual. And, um, okay, I'll go on. The, the art historian Daniel Arras elaborates on this bodily experience. It's if not to see roi, then, then at least to perceive percevoir. This more embodied relationship can be aligned with how Pratt considered her own work. Speaking of another um, painting, Glassy Apples, she told the curator Marie Egan, there's a chip out of the glass bowl and you can almost feel that chip against your tooth which is what I wanted. Pratt elaborates, I wanted you to feel that you could bite into one of the apples, and I thought if I put the chip in the glass, they might get that. 
that. Mm -hmm. So the bodily association between seeing and feeling or haptic visuality was critical to Pratt, who emphasized, I do want people to see beyond the glossy, glassy finish. Um, so it's a really interesting painting and, and way of perceiving her work. And I hadn't realized it when I, when I took this on. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, hmm. OK, I'll talk about her marriage, because there's a, a nice little reference to her marriage to Christopher. And Christopher's also represented by this gallery, so I thought it was appropriate. A few weeks before her wedding, um, this is in 1957, Mary's mother had a chat with her in the garden. Kay West asked, are you going to change your name or will you keep West, which was her maiden name? Mary was shocked by her mother's question, coming from someone she regarded as so retiring and apparently naive. Those are Mary's words. She burst out in response, mother, what a crazy idea, I'll be a Pratt. Um, this is 1957. Pursuing her line of questioning, Kay asked, what, is, what if you get to be a better painter than Christopher. Mary assured her there was no danger of this. <laughs> the day of the wedding arrived, September 12, 1957. Mary remembered that morning. The photographers came, the bridesmaids assembled. I made an effort to look bridal, this is Mary, to be coy, but I wasn't very successful. I snapped at my grandmother, stamped my foot for the first and only time in my life. Um, was almost late for the church, lingering in the locked bathroom so long. As they were driven in a hired Cadillac to the, Cadillac to the Wilmot United Church, Mary noticed that people were stop, stopping in the street to watch them on this otherwise quiet morning in Fredericton, and she began waving, quote, like the queen, <laughs> until admonished by her father. Um, so Christopher and Mary, after the wedding, left for on a brief honeymoon, and by the way, Alex and Rhoda Colville were at the wedding and gave her a, a lovely uh, wedding gift. And um, they went on a brief honeymoon, and then they went, um, caught the uh, Nova Scotia, which was a, a ship th uh, that carried them to uh, Liverpool in England. During their crossing, they were engulfed by a terrible storm. Mary wrote of this experience, I thought that this was really a normal crossing, swallowed a lot of gravel and discovered that washing my husband's shirts and underwear was going to be part of my life that I hadn't hitherto considered. She mentioned the tourist lounge where the chairs slid around, the piano was tied down, and a robust woman, quote, all rouge and lipstick and blonde hair, sang so racy songs. As Mary recalls, one night she looked at me, sort of a sober and pious and seasick with confetti falling from the folds of my skirts and saying, after you get what you want, you don't want it. <laughs> I remember blushing furiously and realizing the truth of that song. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit more of, um, I'm gonna talk about the bed because that's a painting. Um, I don't know if you know it, but it's quite well known in the literature. And it wasn't painted with her photorealist technique. It sort of just precedes that moment. And so I'm just going to open with a quote from Mary. <clears throat> the sight of this familiar part of my life, so surprisingly beautiful, stopped me in my tracks, sent shivers of pleasure through me, that I recognized it as the beginning of a new life for me. It was then as if a door opened, windows opened, something fell apart in my previously closed brain, and all the world around me spoke to me. My eyes had become for me a conduit for physical sensation. So I'm just going to read from that event because it really is a pivotal moment in her career. The weekday began in a very ordinary way for Mary Pratt, preparing breakfast, dressing the children, and packing school lunches, followed by making beds, tidying up, and mopping the floors. But on that particular fall morning in 1968, as Mary walked down a dark hallway to the bedroom she shared with Christopher and opened the door, she was startled by what she saw, an unmade bed with the most marvelous light spilling over it. She explains, there was a blaze of light coming in off the river, that wonderful fall light you get. This vision of a rumpled bed in the morning light, this is me, 
um, is like its red Chanel bedspread unfolding like a Baroque dream before her became a life-changing moment for the artist. Pratt's artistic revelation, how light can illuminate a familiar object, became her guiding inspiration. As she recalls, although I had painted for years, I was never sure of what I should paint. But after seeing the bed in the morning light, that gut reaction to the way it looked was so strong and erotic that I knew if I didn't have a physical connection to the image I was painting, there would be no point in trying to paint it. Pratt later confided, it was shocking how erotic that image seemed to be, and it was a gift. I understood what I had to paint. I was fortunate enough to be turned on by images. So this was a moment where she realized that she could paint the light, but, but light is very transitory, and the light effects are always changing. And so for the next two weeks, she and Christopher slept on the couch or wherever, and she uh, painted the bed as, as she'd seen it. Um, but then when it came to the supper table, um, Christopher, said, Christopher said, there's no way you're going to paint the bed or the, the table for two weeks. And so he took a photo of it with the slide photography. And that was the inception of her photorealist method. So it's a really interesting narrative how the two works actually connect. And she realized that by using photography, she could hold the light long enough to paint. So it became a tool for her and was really an exceptional, um, you know, it began this, the, it, it started her career as, as a painter in that way. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about her, um, her adventure in Toronto, uh, where she was looking for a commercial gallery before Mary Godard's. Christopher was at Mary Godard's, and I think Mary felt she needed to um, define her own, have her own gallery, define her own space. So she had been in, in uh, discussions with uh, Lynn Winnick and David Tuck at the Aggregation Gallery. And um, so she uh, decided to make a foray into Toronto and, and, and get a commercial gallery. And this is in, in the 70s. So I'm just going to quote from the, um, uh, A Room of One's Own, which is a chapter where I talk about her professional development as a, as a women, woman artist. Essential Although aspect of becoming a professional artist. She also knew that productive relationships with art dealers and commercial galleries were crucial to her success. In the spring of 1975, Pratt decided to go to Toronto after an invitation from Lynn Winnick and David Tuck at the Aggregation Gallery, who inquired about a potential show. The gallery had recently relocated to Front Street East, and their airy, lofty space um, featured the work of artists such as Greg Curnow, William Curlick, and Doris McCarthy. Pratt understood how a commercial gallery in Toronto would help establish her both critically and commercially. She, wrote, she later wrote, it was necessary, of course, to have a Toronto gallery. I knew nothing about such things, but the generous uh, Dorothy uh, Cameron persuaded two young dealers to look at my work, and I went to Toronto to confer. Cameron, formerly an art dealer and now a consultant, enjoyed connecting artists with commercial galleries. She had introduced Christopher to the Marlborough Goddard Galleries five years earlier, which was the earlier collaborative gallery. Um, she had in introduced, okay, the aggregation gallery was Mary's golden opportunity, as she acknowledges. Going to the big time was no small thing. I knew I had to pull myself together and make an effort to impress. Um, she realized early on she had to perform the role of the artist and accordingly, quote, I bought clothes, not anything I'd ever worn before. A pair of grey her herringbone trousers, black boots, a black and white polka dot shirt to match the lining of her black velvet jacket, a gold lame tie she had made herself, and to top it off, a black cape with red silk lining and a poor boy cap that matched the trousers. <laughs> As she recounts, I had never looked so unlike myself. I had never had such confidence. For Pratt, the difference between painting in her studio and the business of art was daunting. She recalls the trick of being myself when I'm at work and then stepping outside that person when I'm doing business isn't easy, she adds. For my first foray into the strange world, it's very likely the costume helped. Her sartorial uh, strategy was later noted by the journalist Ann Collins. 
Mary Pratt used to have to dress like, this is her, Mary, Anna Collins. Mary Pratt used to have to dress like a man to come into the art world, to foray in Toronto. Collins elaborates, it was her protective coloration. It proclaimed, I am a serious artist, eccentric, female, and tough. My stuff is the stuff of the woman's movement. I am its domestic heroine. <laughs> Pratt was quick to recognize that being an artist wasn't just about working in a studio, but also about navigating, even performing, the business of art. So it's a really interesting um, development in her career. Um, and she was with the Aggregation Gallery until the, I think it was the early 80s, where she started in group shows, and then around the mid-80s she had her own, um, own solo shows, I think, approximately. Um, so. I also want to just explain how this book also tries to position her work in terms of contemporary art, because she's always been kind of seen as an uh, Atlantic realist painter, and you know, a geographical kind of framing, and um, also limiting. And I started to see her in many different ways. Um, and many early critics and, and also um, gallery owners, dealers, began to recognize that her work shown at the Aggregation Gallery and at the National Gallery in 1975 in a group show was actually um, not only a form of photorealism, one of the earliest forms in Canada, but also she was connected with pop art in a really interesting way. So I just want to show you, because I, I don't have slides, this painting. It's called um, Big Macro. It's really bright and it's quite big and was in her self-made studio. She had a design studio. Ted, or not Ted, um, Ned helped her build it and some other people as well. And um, so she had this studio by about 1984 in Salmonier where Christopher and Mary lived with their family. And so throughout the book there are these interludes. This is called Big Mac because that was her nickname for that painting. And um, she, the, the designer, Julie Schreiber, who, um, from Goose Lane, who designed this beautifully designed book, she made sure that my interludes, and there are seven, and they kind of are short little pithy sections between the longer chapters, but she gave them colored paper, which I love. <laughs> so that was her design, design decision. But I realized that Mary, Mary really loved pop art, and I had no idea. So I'm just going to read a bit from this interlude to give you that idea. I feel so far away from it. I'll just turn around. And... Okay. No, I can't see. <laughs> yeah, you had the lights just right. Okay. Oh, am I? Um, I'm... <laughs> okay, I'll move back because I'm like... <laughs> I didn't realize it was being photographed. Okay, so Big Mac. So this was a painting, some of you may remember, there was a show called Painting the Town here in Toronto, and it was like billboards. Painting by artists were reproduced on billboards all over Toronto. And then this traveled across Canada. And so um, this is Mary um, talking about it. Uh, Pratt completed the work because it sat in her studio for a number of years unfinished for painting the town that opened in Toronto from June to July 1987. The show toured to nine other Canadian cities and included seven artists, including among them Jack Chabolt, um, Gathy Falk, and Yves Gaucher. These uh, paintings were chosen to be reproduced on billboards throughout the city. After seeing her work displayed large, Pratt wrote, wrote in her journal, my board was really the best one, <laughs> which was a pleasant truth for me to observe quietly to myself. And that's very rare for Mary to write anything like that or even think about it. She, um, she was very um, modest, to say the least. Um, but she, it, it really did reproduce well. And she said, she went on to say about where this billboard was located in Toronto. It's very high over the Gardner Expressway and swims in its little lake of blood visible against the sky from miles away. And I just love that. Um, and I also loved the way she connected with artists like David Hockney and Andy Warhol. Both were among Pratt's favorite um, 
20th century artists. She records in her journal, Andy Warhol died a few days ago and acknowledges, I su suspect that my work would have um, neither been accepted nor understood if I hadn't come after him. From supper table to decked mackerel, um, completed soon after Warhol's death, Pratt felt his influence. As she notes in her journal, Christopher says he never took him seriously, um, that he was just part of the American scene. I took him seriously. Um, so I'm really interested in how um, Pratt's work really connects to pop art on, on a number of levels and um, to contemporary art. And this, um, Mary was chosen later on for a show called Billboard that was at the Mass Mocha. And Donna, you got to actually travel with Mary and as her uh, companion. And um, that, that show was in 1999, so almost a decade later, a little over a decade. And that show was much more radical in its, um, and there were only a few Canadian artists included. Um, so just talking about the Mass Mocha, um, it's, uh, everybody knows it, I'm sure, but this contemporary art gallery with its thought-provoking radical shows also commissioned emerging artists to make new work for this show. Pratt was one of two Canadian artists included in Billboard, which featured the work of many prominent, prominent artists, including John Baldessari, the Gorilla Girls, Keith Haring, Felix Gonaz, Go Gonzalez Torres, Les Levine, Jenny Holzer, and Barbara Kruger. And I just think nobody knows that history of Mary Pratt. Like, she's, she was up there with these, these other artists. Um, and so there was a catalog and then these billboards all over North Adams, Massachusetts. And, you know, it was a, a really good opportunity for the, the, the work to be seen um, at large. And, um, yeah, so I really enjoyed connecting the dots between Mary's work and, and other artists. Um, so since Dawn is here as a guest of honor, I would just like to um, read a little bit about this painting which is um, called Cold Cream. Is that okay if I read it? <laughs> it's in the Beaverbrook Art Gallery, and it's one of my favorite paintings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a chapter called This is Donna, and um, this is just the end of the chapter. At the Beaverbrook Art Gallery, I turned to Pratt's singular painting, Cold Cream, um, painted in 1983. She gave this painting to the gallery, but Mary also has given me a gift in this moment. I'm going to start crying. Because <laughs> you're here. This pared down version is more intimate than her larger works. Mm. With Donna's um, head and shoulders extending to the picture frame, I've never cried in public <laughs> over Mary Pratt. I think it's because you're here, Don. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, Donna is shown wearing a red towel, towel wrapped like a turban <clears throat> on her head. A stray, a stray hair falls over her right ear. She has applied the cold cream to her face, which Pratt simulates in lavish traces of impasto paint on the surface of the board. The unctuous, unctuous texture of the cream enlivens the painting to create a more sensual viewing experience. In contrast to the high finish that char characterizes most of her work, Pratt's brushwork is evident, yet this painting is also remarkable for its scarcity of paint, with its traces of underpainting and pencil in evidence. There is a rawness rare in portraiture. On its white gessoed surface, pencil lines indicate a background that Pratt never completes. For a painter who was so professional and finished in much of her work, she seems to have inten intentionally left it incomplete. Pratt tells me it was unfinished and admits, I hardly used any paint at all. Most of the white is underpainting gesso. Usually I don't allow myself this painterly technique. Unless the image is powerful, it only says technique anyway. The painting is playful but also serious as she strips away everything um, all to the essential. I look closely at the painting in the gallery. Donna stares back. There is something tentative about her expression. The word imploring comes to mind. 
Her lips are slightly parted as if to speak. A speck of cold cream on Donna's upper lip is a detail Pratt observes in the slide and considers important enough to include. This attention to detail reminds me of Alice Munro's writing and how she often includes minutiae from life, particularly female lives, to physically anchor her subjects in their own reality. In Pratt's remarkable paintings of Donna Meany, she, hmm, she portrays a woman's vulnerability A woman's vulnerability, rare in the tradition of the female mood. They show a woman is naked rather than nude. What becomes distinct in, in Pratt's work is the long-held friendship and collaboration that existed between the artist and model despite their adversities. Meany tells, later tells me that cold cream is the picture she wants on her obituary page. But this too is Donna. I'm sorry about getting so emotional. Uh, yeah. So I'm not, I'm, where are we for time? Um, so what time? 4.36. 4.36. Okay, it's already been an hour. Wow. Um, so I think I'll, I may leave it there because, yeah. <laughs> sorry, because it's been an hour um, and I'm getting very emotional. Um, but I just want to end maybe with my epilogue, um, what I really wanted to talk about was the last chapter, Fire and Ice, which you see a version of here. Um, my last chapter on Mary was um, very much um, about these late experimental works she did, well, not that late, but 18, uh, 1990s right through to 2010, when she was doing these large mixed media works and they actually she had uh, quite bad arthritis and they kind of freed her up but she was also um, going through some marriage troubles later in her life and she was um, needed a, an expressive outlet so she becomes very expressionistic in her approach and this is an exceptional example of fire and ice so she was painting fire and she was painting ice in different ways and it obviously comes from the Robert Frost poem um, and so I realized the end of her life was very, um, she was quite ailing and ill, but I wanted the, the book to explore her much more experimental work after she left Christopher in particular, and was living on her own, and also producing these wonderful prints um, that, that are on the wall. So there's a section on the prints, which I won't really talk about, but... Um, there's not a lot that's been written about them, so I think it's a really good op opportunity to see, uh, sorry, I can't help them, professor, to see the lusty watermelon that she printed. Um, it's a woodcut print that was a collaboration. Um, and it was a really important um, uh, sort of venture that she went into these various prints on the wall and, you know, kind of was able to um, express herself in a different medium, her interest in film, um, all of these things w are kind of explored in the last chapter. But I just want to end um, with, with my last meeting with Mary, and I'll try not to cry. Um, love was central uh, to Mary Pratt. Not only the love she felt for her children and her grandchildren, for Christopher, and for her many friends and acquaintances, but also in her relationship with her art. Pratt loved to paint. Repeatedly, she has said, that she wanted the viewers of her paintings to love them as much as she did. Pratt recognized that her own legitimacy or her larger legacy resides in a lifetime of painting. In the last few years of her life, although she could no longer paint, Pratt was still highly attuned to her visual world. On my last visit, as we look through the bedroom window at her garden below, she tells me it still gives her much pleasure, the garden. Um, I asked, does, does she miss painting? Pratt answers, no, not really. And pointing to a glass, a vase of flowers on her dresser, she tells me how she still divides the colors visually, as though readying herself to paint. Pratt claimed, my life is a self-portrait, and my life is what I paint. And in her long love affair with vision, experienced from childhood to old age, she painted what she loved. Thank you. Mm.
Yeah, so if there are questions, <laughs> anyone who wants to ask? Yes? I, this is more of a thanks than a question. I so appreciate in your book that you have set aside the notion of rivalries in Mary Pratt's life and careers, um, in particular with female models. And the fact that Donna Mee is here is, is overwhelming, so I can see why you're overwhelmed. Can you say a little bit more about the ways in which her relationships with women, including, I believe, Mary Godar, which a previous book suggested mm -hmm. was a tense one, were in fact enabling and supportive ones? Very good question, and, and, and that they were. Mary was, I mean, I know from my own relationship with Mary that she was an incredibly warm, generous person. I was struck by that, and it enabled me to go forward with the book. Um, and she did speak, um, I mean, I think Mary Goddard was a very powerful personality. She represented Christopher. Mary had several different galleries. She had one in Vancouver as well as um, the Mary Goddard here. But she, um, she admitted that after, on, when she um, had heard about uh, Mary's death, um, she wrote in her journal that um, she thinks that Mary had been one of the most important people in her career. Yeah, and so that was a really a moment for me because she doesn't write a lot about people in her journals in that way, and so it was it was quite um, revealing, I think, of that relationship. And um, Mary had you know many female friends, um, and you know I think the fact that she was actually in that show curated by Mayo Graham called Some Women Canadian Women Artists. It was in 1975, the year of, of the woman, um, that it kind of positioned her within feminism in a way that Mary had been unprepared for. But, but I think, you know, one of the first questions I asked Mary was, are you a feminist? And she said, yes. And, and she embraced um, feminism in a way that I hadn't, I hadn't expected. And, and I, as I was writing it, I, 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 may, I realized she was, um, you know, she, she was very, um, supportive of other women, other artists, um, you know, there was, there's no question, and, and that she needed that network to go forward. And, and it, very interesting, uh, Brenda, I've forgotten Brenda's name, last name. Kylie. Kylie. Her, she was the, the a studio assistant and, and manager of both Christopher and Mary, even after they split up. And she, she was an incredible source of information as well. And without Brenda, who kind of was, you know, worked with both Christopher and, and, and Mary, I don't think their estate would be in the shape it is in. It's quite exceptional. Yeah. So Brenda was a key, key person. Anyone else? Yes. Um, would you comment on <coughs> Mary's second marriage and any impact it had on her art? Yeah, um, it, it, I don't know if it had any much impact on her art. Um, it happened very late in her life. I think what, that, what it enabled her to do was to kind of get over um, Christopher and to move on. And Jim was um, an art historian and painter from the US and he knew a lot about the scene in New York, which she didn't agree wholly with, she doesn't didn't like de Kooning, he did, um, but she was also he took her to places like New York, to Europe. They traveled, even though um, she wasn't, you know, she was suffering a bit for she had arthritis and hip problems. Um, so he kind of opened her world, but they increasingly didn't agree on things. And um, I found a lot of stuff in her journals where she writes rather negatively about his influence and um, I think maybe it made her more assured of what she was doing mm -hmm. in her work more than anything because he worked so differently his painting was very different very sort of almost symbolist um, at least the stuff I've seen and, and um, you know kind of dreamy kind of works and hers is this kind of hard realism but when you start looking at it there's so much more and in fact the more I look at Mary's work, um, not so much the prints, but a little bit in this, you know, if you look at the water, um, there's a lot of abstraction in Mary's work. And that's what makes it really interesting. And so, you know, the whole abstract expressionist movement, that was um, Jim's thing in terms of celebrating art, but he didn't, I don't know if he painted so much that way. But 
um, but her work actually there's a lot more to it the more you look at it it's it's riveting and, and it stays with you much more because she plays with the realism and the abstraction in the painting in a really interesting way particularly pattern yep Eve um, sorry I'm hidden in the back here um, Christopher at times tell us with respect to Mary's work and I remember reading when I was doing the research for this self-portrait show catalog that he was quite adamant about the fact that this is not photorealism and we know from looking at the paintings because you know it's all about the paintings not mm -hmm. about the classifications mm -hmm. that in fact as she's turning and twisting and going back and forth mm -hmm. between the slide image and what finally appears on the canvas, mm -hmm. she makes really profound changes oh, yes. to yeah. what was in the slides. And I wondered if you would talk a bit about that. Yeah, the it's, one there's a lot of subconscious stuff going on in, in these yeah. pictures. Oh, too, right? yeah, no. If, I mean, having the opportunity to study the slides and the and the finished painting was really revealing. Um, the famous painting at the AGO, the service station, which is the moose hanging off moose. the back of a truck station. Um, I realized, like I, there were some photos of her in progress on that painting, and she had taken the photos, and they were shocking to her, and she put them away, and then she pulled them out after some encouragement from Mayo Gray and, and Adrian Clarkson, and she pulled them out, and she'd also gone through some life crises of her own, and realized she could paint this very tough subject, and also she wanted to, by 1978 <coughs> when she painted that, she wanted to position herself as not just the kitchen artist or the poet of the kitchen or whatever the critics were calling her. She wanted to be different. And she so she painted that very tough painting as well as her first um, female nude. And she, in that painting, there's some photographs of her doing it that I think probably Christopher took. And they're very different from the final painting. There's a lot more in that painting. So there's lots of decisions she made between the photography and the final product. She changes color, she changes what's in the composition, and she, she looks at pattern and form a lot. So I think that's a really good point that, that she, you know, it's not just straight copying from the image, and it's much, much more sophisticated than that. Yeah. Any other questions? Like, that's it. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to sign books yeah, okay. or whatever. Okay.